Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Dodd, president of the Jesse Helms Center Foundation. I want to welcome everyone to the campus of Wingate College here in Wingate, North Carolina for the Jesse Helms Center Fall Lecture featuring Justice Clarence Thomas of the Supreme Court of the United States. I particularly want to welcome our C-SPAN audience as well. Now, Edwin Bagley, professor of religion here at Wingate, will now give our invocation. May we pray. It is before you, O oh God, that we stand, respectable citizens with high regard for our own accomplishments and positions, professors, lawmakers, accomplished students, and the like. Yet, our heart of hearts, we know we are all so many sheep and goats living toward your judgment. In our vanity, we create and destroy according to our own whims. We build up and tear down with standards of our own making. In our short-sightedness, we spurn truth, misleading the youth who take us as models for their own lives. In our greed, we shut our ears to those whose lives are daily crushed by the wheels of progress. And in our enmity, we relish nothing so much as the opportunity to belittle those with whom we disagree. Do not leave us in this sorry state, we pray. Soften our hard hearts. Transform our hard heads. Grant that we may for at least a few of our days, be compassionate and humble, working hardest of all at the tasks that you have set before us, reconciling all peoples of the world to one another and to you. Help us be the body of Christ for this age. Amen. I ask you to remain standing, please. Sorry. <laughs> Scott Morrison, president of the Wingate College Student Government Association, will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It is now my pleasure to introduce the men most responsible for Wingate College's recent ranking in the top tier of the Southern Liberal Arts College's uh, by U.S. News & World Report, the president of Wingate College, Dr. Jerry McGee. As we draw closer and closer to our centennial, many of us at Wingate College have begun looking at the personal side of our college's history and at the ways our alumni have put what they learned at this institution into practice in their careers. Members of the Wingate family have distinguished themselves as educators, members of the clergy, in the field of medicine, in law and business, and in government service. Our alumnus, Senator Jesse Helms, has given more than two decades in service to the people of North Carolina the people of the United States, and the people who cherish the principles of de demographic, excuse me, democratic government around the world. Senator Helms has used his position as U.S. Senator to be a spokesperson for the values which have been bedrock for society. Loyalty, love for family, encouragement to self-sufficiency, 
respect for traditional mores, a passion for freedom. His anticipated new responsibilities as head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will make him one of our busiest senators. We hope that his schedule will never become so crowded that he must forego his visits here. It is my personal pleasure to see Senator Helms back at Wingate College, especially for this historic evening. Please join me in welcoming him home, Senator Helms. The committee will now come to order. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Dr. Jerry McGee, for your gracious introduction. Wingate has many fine qualities, but maybe it has the only quality that I'm going to mention. I don't know of another college or university in America that has an NCAA football official as its president. <laughs> Shortly, I am informed, he will officiate at his number 200 NCAA game. About three weeks ago, uh, he had a hazardous football game. He was hit by a flying missile. One of the football players had been hit real hard, and he flew horizontal across the ground and hit Jerry McGee on the chin. But he survived. And thank you, Jerry, and God bless you. Tonight's event is another in a series of appearances on the Wingate College campus by prominent and significant citizens of our time. This is a very special evening. Tonight's program is being telecast nationwide by C-SPAN, which in my judgment is the fairest and most objective news medium in America today. C-SPAN never tries to interpret the events it covers. C-SPAN never presumes to tell you what you should think about the events of today. C-SPAN lets the newsmakers speak for themselves and lets you make up your own mind about what is right or wrong. And that's what is about to happen here tonight. Now, before I present the distinguished American who honors us this evening by his presence, Please indulge me, if you will, some observations, admittedly personal, about Wingate College, the institution that went out of its way to help me long ago when I was graduated from high school at Monroe, six miles from here, amidst the grinding depression of the 1930s. There was no money to go to college, but I had a lucky break. The president of Wingate College of that time insisted that I come and enroll anyhow. I remember his sitting in our modest home in Monroe and assuring that he and the college would take a chance on me. And I've never forgotten that and never will. Decades later, when time came for me to decide which institution in America should receive my official Senate papers, I respectfully declined the overtures of several major universities, then seeking the papers. I am so conservative, you know, that they knew that scholars would want to come and research the career of this senator. <laughs> Instead, I chose to offer them to Wingate College that had given me a chance long ago when there had seemed to be no hope. 
In receiving these official papers, the first truckload of them, <laughs> at least, Wingate College's then president, Dr. Paul Korsh, the predecessor of Jerry McGee, insisted that there be established a foundation and a headquarters to supervise the transfer of the deluge of documents. And that was the beginning of the so-called Jesse Helms Center that is now sponsoring the lecture series and a myriad of other projects and programs, all dedicated to restoring and preserving the moral and spiritual priorities that made this country great in the first place. I must confess, for the first time publicly, that I was not at all impressed or enthusiastic about this idea and such a foundation being created in my name, but I now gratefully acknowledge that the many programs being undertaken by the Center to assist and establish a bond with young Americans, well, to be frank about it, it's all quite amazing to me. I thank the Lord for allowing me to be a part of it. And on behalf of the, the board of directors of the foundation, if you haven't visited the center, we invite you to do so and, and tell us what you think. Now then, I have been honored to welcome a number of great Americans to the center and to the Wingate College campus, and we're going to continue to do that. Next year, we have some exciting prospects. I, I don't think I ought to go into the identification bit tonight, but suffice it to say that they will be people well known to you, people who have had a significant impact in their respective countries and especially in and on the United States of America. We've had uh, Gene Kirkpatrick, who to me is one of the most intellectual ladies on the American scene today. And then there was the delightful Steve Forbes, Jr. The official name, formal name is Malcolm S. Forbes, Jr a man who demonstrated to the young people when he met with them a remarkable insight, a remarkable intellect, and a remarkable love of young people. I hope you'll come back, and uh, that has been suggested by a number of students already to me today. There have been and will be many others in the coming months but I'm obliged to note that the students on this campus have found warm and genuine friends in these notables coming to the college. And in response, the young people have shown affection and genuine respect for the visitors. Mr. John Dodd, whom you've just heard, who is president of the center and the foundation, I believe has included in tonight's printed program a biographical review of the career of tonight's distinguished guest. And instead of reading that to you, let me instead share with you a few personal observations about this man. He's an impressive American. To me, and I think to millions of Americans across this land, he is a true profile in courage. Millions of Americans were watched on television, including United States senators, who witnessed with disgust the vilification by hearsay of Clarence Thomas, who had been nominated by President Bush to serve as an associate justice of the United States Supreme Court. Now, I know firsthand the agony that Clarence Thomas experienced 
What a travesty to be hounded by certain members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, senators who piously profess to believe Anita Hill. The spectacle of Senator Kennedy, of all people, sitting in Mar- sitting in moral judgment of a nominee who was being obviously castigated for days on end by witnesses who, to this good day, have never presented a shred of credible evidence to support contrived charges against Judge Clarence Thomas. Now, the latest journalistic low blow came the other night from and by ABC television. But fortunately, the polls show that the American people still don't believe the critics of Clarence Thomas. Nor do they believe the authors of a book ear earmarked with contrivance, nor do they believe ABC television for its shameless one hour of regurgitating innuendo that never had any merit in the first place. <laughs> now, there are some of us who know and who have, have known the real Clarence Thomas, born in a tiny community in Georgia near Savannah and raised by God-fearing grandparents. He, ended, he attended first a seminary and then went on to graduate with honors from Holy Cross College, then to Yale, and he doesn't apologize too openly about that. <laughs> but he did earn his doctorate of laws there. And then is when I and other senators who now recognize the character assassination aimed at Clarence Thomas first met this man. Senator Danforth of Missouri, who by the way is an Episcopal clergyman, hired Clarence Thomas to serve as a staff attorney on the senator's staff. Let me summarize it this way. Ladies and gentlemen, I regard Clarence Thomas as a fine and decent man. He is and has been a deeply religious man. And to my knowledge, there has never been one scintilla of bona fide evidence against this man's character or his career or his life. And that is why I am honored to present to you the 106th American to be nominated and confirmed to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, the Honorable, and I emphasize that, the Honorable Clarence Thomas. Thank you, Senator. Well, thank you all very much. Senator Helms, Dr. McGee, and friends. It's a real pleasure to be here. I had not really heard that much about Wingate until Senator Helms called me about three weeks ago and told me how fine a school it was and how wonderful a place it would be to visit. And by my account today, he's been absolutely right in his estimate. I am not going to, as I have done in the past, spend a lot of time with a long prepared text for a number of reasons. 
I do have a lot to say. It's a challenge to read my own handwriting. <laughs> but I'll get it said. Uh, and when Senator Helms called me, I told him that it was the beginning of a sitting week and that I normally take two or three months to prepare a lecture, sometimes a year. Now you say, you must write a word a day or something. <laughs> but usually it takes that long to, for me to get things done. But it's interesting that as he called, I had had some thoughts about another subject that I wanted to develop over time. And it's not a lecture, so students among you, don't fear. I'm not going to go through a lot of gyrations. Um, I'll do that once a year. Uh, but I'd just like to chat with you a little bit tonight. Um, first of all, it's really a delight for me to be on a college campus in which college students act like students as though they want to learn something as opposed to instruct the world. I think that that's a throwback for me to my years in school, particularly my early years. And it's most appreciated, appreciated. And I'm sure that many others who follow me to this campus will appreciate it and would more than be, be more than welcome to return or delighted to return. I'm sure that I will go back and tell others who haven't been here of my trip and the manner in which civility continues to reign on a college campus. That the students... <laughs> you know, my grandmother told me something years ago. She said, you can't talk and listen at the same time. And a friend of mine recently was telling me the story of a young person who went to one of the wise men to learn more about philosophy. And that that wise man, as he student walked into the room, was pouring a cup of tea. And as he poured, he got to the top of the cup and the student said, I would like you to teach me your philosophy. And the wise man continued to pour, and the cup began to run over. And the student said, you're pouring the tea. You can't get any more tea into that cup. And the wise man said, this cup is like you. It is already full. It serves no purpose to pour any more in. Unless you are willing to empty yourself, there is no way I can teach you anything. I think for me that in a lot of ways demonstrates what is necessary to learn. If you know it all, you can't learn. If you're talking, you can't listen. I know I've been criticized for not talking a lot on the bench, but I think that if I wanted to talk a lot, I'd be on the other side of the bench. <laughs> Years ago, when I was a kid, we would occasionally, I think twice in my lifetime, take trips from Savannah, Georgia to the Bronx in New York to visit my grandmother's relatives, and we would stop in Philadelphia. And my grandfather, I don't know why he had this schedule, but we would always have to leave at 2 a.m. Why 2 a.m.? I have never quite figured that out. But we would all pile into our Pontiac, and we would drive relentlessly. That was before the interstates. And by the time we got to the North Carolina border, he would say, now, we're way up north. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're coming from Savannah, this is way up north. <laughs> I have 
been fortunate to know Senator Helms over 15 years, and it's rather interesting. You know, of course, I was a young upstart when I went to Washington, and you heard of the fiery Jesse Helms, who was Dr. No, is it? Or is it Mr. No? Senator No. <laughs> <laughs> and it was always interesting. I was a young staffer running around in 79, and no one knew who I was. I was full of energy and had pockets full of reports and interesting reading information, looking for opportunities to make trouble. And you would see Senator Helms in the hall, as you would see other senators down in tunnels as you travel from, I was in the Russell Senate Office Building, as you travel from the Senate Office Building to the Capitol. And it was always, some senators would never deign to speak to you. In fact, if you got on that little tram going from the Senate Office Building to the Capitol, and certain senators got on the tram, you had to get off. They only used one seat, but you had to get off the whole thing. I didn't understand that, it's sort of like, if they got on Amtrak, would everybody have to get off Amtrak? <laughs> you know? But you got off because you were a lowly staffer and you conducted yourself as a lowly staffer. But when you saw Senator Helms, he always had a good word. I said, oh my goodness, he's supposed to be a mean man. Why is it that he's always talking? Why does he say good morning? Why does he say good afternoon? You know, you get on the elevator, it's good morning. He asked you, how are you doing? Who, who do you work for? You see him talking to little kids. You see him talking to other insignificant people like me. And I have always been taught that on a personal level, you judge a person by the way he or she treats the least among us. I always find it fascinating that people can talk in theory about how it's nice to be good to other people. And then you see how they treat cafeteria help, or janitors, or bus drivers. The people who are just doing their jobs and living their lives. I can say that I've only seen Senator Helms treat people with dignity. And I think that when we judge, we judge as he treats the least among us. And in my estimate, that has been very well. In 10 years since I left the U.S. Senate, the 10 years immediately after that, and so much gets lost in the turbulence. But in those 10 years, I think back sometimes. First of all, I was 60 pounds lighter. I like to think that it's because I have big bones, but <laughs> then that means my bones grew. <laughs> um, but in 10 years, from 1981 to 1991, I had been nominated and confirmed five times. And I must say that at the end of the last one, my head was spinning and I just say no now when asked if I want to be nominated again. I'd like to talk a minute about the current views of ethics. When we think of ethics laws today, what do we think of? In the government, we talk about the ethic fo ethics forms that are due sometimes in May. We have to report things such as a jacket, belt buckles, box of cigar that someone sent you. You have to report whether or not you're in debt or out of debt. Stocks you own, that's always easy from a zero. <laughs> Is that ethics or are those just simply ethics forms? We have to report our outside income. If we fail to report it correctly, is that ethical or unethical? Or do we simply 
failed to fill out a form correctly. I think that one can comply with all these ethical forms, fill out all the boxes, figure out all the categories, comply exactly, and still be unethical. One can fill them out incorrectly and be quite ethical. After law school, I was, like so many students, heavily indebted. Series of student loans, national defense loans, guaranteed student loans. I think I had the whole range. I had a cafeteria plan, some of everything. But a friend or a colleague who was very learned in bankruptcy and apparently in debt repayment avoidance, suggested that I simply declare bankruptcy and discharge all these debts. At the time, student loans were still dischargeable in bankruptcy. And I looked at him as though he were from a different planet. And I said, how can you do that? He said, well, it's legal. The bankruptcy laws were designed to give you a fresh start, and you need a fresh start. I said, but I gave my word. I said I'd repay. Of course, I was criticized for saying that, that I gave my word I'd repay. But where had I heard that? I'd heard it from my grandfather, where your word was your bond. A deal was finalized with a handshake. And this was a promise to repay, no matter what the bankruptcy law said. Of course, it was not illegal for me to discharge my debt. But was it ethical? What do you think? You decide whether it's legal, ethical, both, neither one or the other. There's much in my view that is legal, that's technically correct, that violates no law, no rules, no regulations. But it does violate that little thing we call our conscience. Would discharging a debt on which I gave my word, violate your conscience. Recently, I was chatting with someone who told me about a person who was boasting quite openly about having gotten a very expensive item for a steal at a local department store. Apparently, this item had been improperly marked for sale. In fact, it was marked some one or two hundred dollars below the actual price. There was no question whatsoever that she paid the full marked price, but she knew it was the wrong price. Ethical? You know, I ask myself about all sorts of things. My wife says, you're going to drive yourself nuts. Is it ethical or right for someone to barge in front of a line of traffic when everybody else obeys the law? Is it ethical to cheat on an exam? Some years ago, when I was taking Latin, there were rules. There were kind of honor codes. And by the way, I saw that honor house over there. I think I'm going to apply to Wingate next year and try to be an honor student. That looks like it's good living over there. Um, a part of that honor code was that you not use assistance in translating from Latin to English or English to Latin, that you do it on your own. We used to call those trots or ponies. You couldn't use those. 
and some of us would never do it. Not because you couldn't get away with it, because no one was watching, but just because you could get away with it doesn't make it right. Is it ethical? In Jefferson City, Missouri, I went, of course, there. That was my first job out of law school. I went to work with Senator Danforth when he was Attorney General. And he boasted then that he would give us more work for less money than anybody in the United States. <laughs> At that, he succeeded. But one morning, again, not having discharged those debts in bankruptcy, I was still laboring under the weight of the debt. And I would normally go to work between 4 and 6 a.m. in the morning. Well, 4 and 6 a.m., that's redundant. And one morning, I saw a dark object on the sidewalk. And I looked down, it was a wallet, and it was stuffed with $20 bills. And I went to work, and of course, there's nobody there but me and one janitor. And I sit down at my desk, I open it, and six, seven, eight hundred dollars in $20 bills. My initial reaction was, manna from heaven. <laughs> that this is exactly the blessing I've been looking for. Well, little conscience says, this is not yours. So I called the gentleman up at about 8 o'clock, and he was upset with me for calling him at 8 o'clock. Told him I had his wallet, and he said, ah, I'll be there at 10 o'clock. He comes by at 10 o'clock, he's very rude, took his wallet and left. I always think back on that. Was it ethical, or would it have been ethical to keep this man's wallet? He certainly wasn't polite. He didn't deserve it because he didn't say, thank you, I'm grateful, you saved my life. But even if he was a grouch and mean and impolite, would it have been ethical to keep his wallet? Can one form the habit of doing what one can get away with? Do we know people who do that? Oh, it's legal. Technically, I'm within the bounds. The law lets me do this. But do the laws establish our conscience and our personal ethical standards? There are things that, in my view, can be perfectly legal and totally unethical. You think about it. But what if we change it a little? What if they're among us rather than simply doing the things that are technically legal? What if we do things to go along, to get along? We go along to get along with others. We don't want to rock the boat. We want to take the middle of the road. What if all of our friends drink to excess, for example? We've all been down that road. We've all been pressured by our peers to do dumb things, things that left to our own design we would never do, things that we wouldn't do because we thought they were wrong, chances we wouldn't take. How many of us have been cajoled into doing things by friends? criticized into doing things by friends. If you don't do it, everybody is going to hate you. Nobody's going to invite you to a party. We're not going to let you in the sorority. Is one's conduct less unethical just because one is forced to do something by criticism? What if you were cajoled or criticized for not killing someone? Would you give in? 
and then say it wasn't murder because your peers told you to do it? Wasn't your fault? It's not wrong? What about stealing? Would it cease to be stealing because you gave in to pressure from your friends? What about cheating? Oh, everybody cheated on that exam. It can't be wrong. Everybody's doing it. It can't be wrong. Can the majority set your ethical standard? Can they establish your little conscience? What if your friends cajoled you because you refuse to hate, to dislike? Does it cease to be hate if you finally hate because they cajoled you into hating? Some years ago, while I was a young man, I was subjected to some racial slurs and some jokes. And as the years have gone on, uh, I've come to understand that there's a mob mentality of doing things like ridiculing others in a group. That a portion of that is going along to get along. They're all doing it. It wasn't just me. These are my friends. We've all heard that. Can those who went along with the racial slurs now say that their conduct was okay? that it was ethical, or at least that it was not unethical, because they were pressured by their friends and they didn't want to lose their friends? Does it absolve them? Does it change the nature of the conduct because they were forced to do it? Stated in a different way, is it unethical to be a coward? Because indeed, are you not a coward when you give in? Conversely, do we have a moral obligation to stand against the world for what we believe? Do we have a moral obligation to stand against hate, to stand against what is wrong? If we don't have a moral obligation, then it would seem that we are conceding that there is a price for our beliefs for our values, things that we say are central. Or perhaps that we are saying that we can only resist the pressure so long. We can only take so much criticism. We can only fight so hard. Is that the price? A little more than a decade ago, in fact, 1983, I was completing my first year at EEOC, and it was a year from hell. It was the first time in my life I'd ever been subjected to criticism. I had, first time, I had been told that I was no longer black. That was news to me. I look at myself and <laughs> it wasn't like I was fading or anything. <laughs> but suddenly I was no longer black. And regardless of what anyone says, there are certain things that do hurt. And constant harangues did. And I was a young man. People suddenly, I think they seen that I was, to think that I was this age when I was there. Well, I was in my early 30s. I had never experienced that kind of animus toward me. And I started feeling sorry for myself. And we all, when we feel sorry for ourselves, especially when you're young, where do we go? We go back home. So I talked to my grandfather and sort of cried on his shoulder. And I said, I'm really getting criticized. I said, it, it really hurts. And he looks at me in a straightforward way. He said, well, son, just stand up for what you believe in. And I still, to this day, keep a bust of him above me at work. Of course, it has a different inscription on it. But it, I look into his eyes, and he's looking down on me. 
and it still sort of says, stand up for what you believe in. But you all know, as I know, that standing up is actually a lot easier said than done. Isn't that easy? In fact, shortly after he told me this, in fact, just a few months, both of my grandparents had died. And at this time, the grief compounded the difficulties I already faced. It was as though more hot coals had been heaped on my head. And at that time, I'd said to myself that I'd had enough. I wanted to change my views. I wanted to go along to get along. I prayed that my views would change. You know, it's really interesting when you ask God to say, God, make my views different. That's really bold of me. It was my hope that if my views changed, then the criticism and the animus would evaporate. And I used to think over and over, let this cup pass away from me. I never wanted to think about the other part, but thy will not mine be done. Let this cup pass away from me. But as much as I would pray to be comfortable, to have my views changed so I'd be popular, they didn't. Sure, I wanted them to change. I wanted to be liked. I wanted to be popular. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote in the City of God that the desire for fame tempts even noble minds. But my reviews, my views remain the same. Hard as I would pray, they wouldn't change. My beliefs remain the same. My attitudes remain the same. So my only choice was to stand up for my views or to abandon them, to turn and run from myself, to abandon my views without being convinced that they were the wrong views. Think of that. You abandon your views because you're scared. In essence, you lie to yourself. You say, because I can't take the pressure, I really don't believe what I think I believe. In fact, there was nothing but dishonesty because the truth of the matter was that I was saying to myself that I did not have the courage or the fortitude to accept the consequences of my honestly held beliefs. Now, is this ethical? Is lying to myself ethical? Is abandoning something I believe in ethical? It is, is it honest to cut and run from my own beliefs? What about yours? Sometime after that, and during this period, I would make daily visitations to church, and I had a simple prayer. And I use it some, uh, even to this day. Father, grant me the wisdom to know what is right and the courage to do it. That's a simple prayer, but a tall order. You know, there's a price for everything that we do. We think sometimes it's free, but there's always a price. We all know that. And there's a price to pay for beliefs. Sometimes that price is that it's just a little bit of inconvenience. Sometimes it's harsh criticism. Sometimes you're excoriated. Sometimes you're beaten down. Sometimes you're ostracized. But is there enough discomfort out there to make you give up your beliefs? Is there enough criticism to say that you believe the opposite of what you really believe? In a sense, to 
confess that you really lied to yourself? Are your beliefs worth, worth your life? Well, mine are. And life without my beliefs, it's not worth living. I recently became intrigued by the Battle of Gettysburg. I think we all probably picked up a paperback copy of Killer Angels and saw Gettysburg either in videotape or in the movies. And I had some years ago read the battle cry of freedom. But in reading Killer Angel and seeing Gettysburg, I was particularly intrigued by Pickett's charge. So I went to Gettysburg and I looked across this open expanse going into hills and I thought about it. Who in his right mind would charge across a mile and a half of open field in the face of cannons and rifles? Is there anything any of us believe in. Forget the debate about the Civil War. Just think about Pickett's charge. Is there anything that any of us believe in that we would run across a mile and a half of open field into secured hills facing cannons and rifles? To this day, I still wonder about that. Is there a picket charge left in any of us about anything? Picket charge for our beliefs, for our values, for our families, for our spouses, for our friends? Is there a picket charge left in us for our country? Is there a Normandy Beach left in us? Is there an Iwo Jima left in us? What's left in us? Have we become a nation of cowards? Would it have been acceptable if the soldiers at Gettysburg had simply deserted? Would it have been acceptable if they ran and hid and said, I don't believe in anything strong enough to charge across a mile and a half of open field. It's not worth it to me. I don't believe that strongly. I want to go along to get along. Is it acceptable for us to run or hide from our beliefs because they may cost us our lives? Is it ethical to desert our beliefs, to cower from our beliefs? Is cowardice ethical when it comes to our beliefs? Is it right to run from our beliefs even though we still have them? I dare say no nor will cowardice rid our society of that which is bad or preserve that which is good. Cowardice did not found this country and cowardice will not preserve it. As Elmer Davis is reported to have said, the Republic was not established by cowards and cowards will not preserve it. We, my friends, our duty bound to be courageous. Thank you all and God bless you. Justice Clarence Thomas has been on the Supreme Court since 1991. He was appointed by President Bush to replace Justice for 